so in 2008, I moved back down to my hometown of McAllen, Texas, and it shares its border with Mexico. And so my friend and I were hanging out one day, and we were driving down a road, and we came to just a really quick stop, right? Paid no attention, and all of a sudden she says, God, that's so Mexican. And I chewed on that for just a little bit. What does she mean by that so Mexican? I thought that was kind of interesting. See, because in front of us, sticking prominently straight out of this van, was an air conditioning unit that was traditionally used to cool homes. And so it wasn't a big deal at the time, but as my stay in the valley became permanent, well, so did my affair with that's so Mexican. It was all around me, this term, right? And it was used oftentimes, I realized, like when I went to my tia's house and somebody would say, that's so Mexican, because what I thought was butter in a tub was menudo, <laughs> right? And so I realized then that the that's so Mexican is actually kind of referring to a description of reusing or repurposing an item to be either used for something else or just reinventing its purpose, right? That was pretty fascinating to me. And so then I kind of started doing some like anecdotal social research. And so I started asking other people here in the Rio Grande Valley if they had ever had what's a that's so Mexican moment. And I realized that everybody does. So a pastor friend of mine, Pastor Isaro at BT McAllen, he said, well, of course I do. My mother used to put aluminum foil on all of the windows in our home. I had never seen that before, though I grew up here in McAllen. And so he said, I asked him, well, what's the purpose of that? Well, I mean, we couldn't afford curtains and we couldn't afford tint, but we needed to keep our home cool inside. And aluminum foil was practically free and so... It was, that's so Mexican of us to use aluminum foil to keep our home cool. And to me, that was very fascinating. So I continued to ask, and a friend of mine and an engineer and educator, Jorge Garcia, told me that his abuela or his grandmother had that so Mexican moments all the time. You see, she didn't have a lot of money, and so she would buy a lot of potatoes. And he said, like, a lot of potatoes. And so she had all of the potato sacks in her home. They were just stacked up. At the time, the potato sacks were like really durable and really large, he said. And so what she started doing, because they came free with the potatoes, she started making hammocks out of them because she did not have air conditioning in her home and it was too hot to sleep inside. So she tore those potato sacks up that were free with the potatoes and she made herself a hammock. I thought that was genius. I was fascinated by this concept of that so Mexican, but I was doubly fascinated with the fact that it was used in such a negative connotation in the Rio Grande Valley. See, because when I saw that van and when pastor told me about the aluminum foil and then Jorge told me about the potato sacks and then get this one, I never knew that if you press cactus or nopal down and you dehydrated it, it became almost solid and people would use it to make chanclas or flip-flops. Because you know what? Cactus is free and they just pick it. But shoes were not. That's pretty Mexican. <laughs> and so what I realized then, that the that's so Mexican that we use down here in the Rio Grande Valley is this overarching term to describe solutions to problems that we can't pay for and that we might not have the financial resources to pay for a solution, but we're all problem solvers. And the that's so Mexican in us and those that are living in poverty I want you to think about it for a second. It's genius to be able to make and to reinvent and to innovate with just your mind and what you have there when you don't have financial resources is in no way negative, but instead is a maker movement 
It's one of the most positive things I believe that we see coming out of colonias in neighborhoods, that we see coming out of barrios, is that that's so Mexican spirit in all of us. And so I want to share with you a that's so Mexican moment in my life. But before I do that, I'm going to be really honest with you. I didn't grow up in a home that was deep in poverty. But I did, however, grow up in an area that was saturated with poverty around me. You see, I live in Hidalgo County in the Rio Grande Valley. It is continuously the number one poorest county in all of the United States. So I know what poverty looks like. And I also have taught in schools that are highly saturated with those living in poverty as well. So I can tell you that though I did not live in poverty in my childhood, I give to you now something that's difficult for me. When I graduated from Texas State University in San Marcos, I had a college diploma in hand as a single mom, and I had a stack full of unpaid bills. And I was living in Central Texas, and my that's so Mexican in me was what got me here. You see, I didn't have a lot of cash, but I had seen in my life experiences and in my childhood growing up in areas of high poverty that just because you don't have the financial resources is not an excuse. So I needed my tire changed. So I learned to change it myself because I could not afford to pay somebody to do it. That was my that's so Mexican in me. And then later, I had to get my oil changed on my truck, and I realized that I could save like 25 bucks if I did it myself. So my that's so Mexican in me, try to see the way the guy did it. I looked and just observed, and I did it myself because that was that so Mexican, and I saved money because of it. So years later, I came back down to the Rio Grande Valley, and thankfully, things were looking up. I had just finished my master's degree at the University of Texas Pan American. I was able to send my son to private school here in McAllen. I had a mortgage. I was doing well. I was being able to pay my bills on time and even in excess. And I found myself teaching in a school here in McAllen that was about 99.2% Hispanic. And there was quite a bit of, um, of poverty in that school. So, me loving technology, and that's the initiative we'll be doing on campus. I started to put all of my assignments and news and updates and all of those great things, I started to put them online, and I noticed that nobody was looking. Why wasn't anybody viewing my website? I was frustrated. So then I asked my kids one day at De Leon Middle School, I said, why aren't you looking at what I'm putting? Well, miss, I don't have internet. What do you mean you don't have internet? I don't have internet at home. See, me, like many of you, we take for granted that there's Wi-Fi access everywhere, right? That was frustrating to me. So I, after a few days, I went back and I asked my avid students in my classroom, I said, um, Raise your hand if you own a smartphone or if somebody in your home owns a smartphone. All, their, all of their hands went up except for one. That was it. That was the solution. So the very next day, I remember me being super terca. I'm, gonna, I'm going to figure out a way to connect all of those families and their students to our school. And so I started calling technology companies. I kind of just Googled it. And I started calling technology companies, and they would tell me, oh, it's just $25,000 for a school app. A Houston firm told me it was $35,000 for a school app. So after kind of the initial like sticker shock, I realized there is nobody in public education that's going to be able to afford a mobile app. I had a that's so Mexican moment that changed my life forever. I said, I cannot afford to buy that app, so I'm going to make it. So at a higher level, my that's so Mexican spirit decided that I was going to learn to build an app. And so I got up and I Googled words that, again, would just would change my life forever. 
how to build an app. You see, because that, that, that's so Mexican in me, it wasn't an excuse that I didn't have the money. And so after eight months in the middle of teaching and coaching and nursing my daughter and hanging out with my son and trying to be the very best wife to my husband, through a lot of insomnia and through a lot of exhaustion, my, my that's so Mexican in me helped me Error after error after error. The resilience that many of those that's so Mexican moments of solving problems when you don't have resources, I clicked on it one day and it ran. There was no error. There were no X's. That software was running. And I want to tell you, you may not be impressed by that, but I'm going to be real with you. See, I have a BFA in design, and I failed algebra with a 38. I graduated late from Texas State because I could not even pass my math models class, which was like lower than remedial. So how was I then becoming a coder? It's because of the that's so Mexican in me. So at one point, the McAllen Chamber of Commerce said, hey, I'm going to give you $10,000, and I want you to start your own business. Well. Thankfully, my that's so Mexican in me did not let the fact that I have no idea how to run a business, nor do I have any prior experience with running a business, stop me. And again, I believe it's because it was that's so Mexican of me to just learn and solve the problem myself. And so we started the business. And about two years later, mostly because of Twitter, and by the way, Twitter's free, which is that's so Mexican of me, I and my mobile app, Educom, was now in seven states. It was being used in seven states throughout the country. All of it was worth it. The learning of the that's so Mexican in me, y'all, in May of 2015, Educom, my little startup in South Texas that was birthed out of the that's so Mexican was acquired by Campus Orb in California. They bought that thing from me. <laughs> and so many people say, a lot of the questions they'll ask me, right? What, what made you say, well, I'll build an app? And the reality is that the only real answer I can say is that I never knew anything else. And the people around me in the Rio Grande Valley, we don't know anything else. We just know that if there's a problem, we don't use the excuse of money. We solve it ourselves. And so Time Magazine in 2014, they featured an article. And it was called, The Maker Movement is the Future of America. And they defined maker movement as independent thinkers, inventors, and creators. Problem solvers, innovators, does that not sound like that's so Mexican? Those of you out there that are leading organizations and systems, I would beg the question, would you rather have somebody as your CFO or your founding partner that has had a childhood of poverty where the life experiences was to innovate, and to problem solve, and to be efficient, and to be resourceful with what they had, and to not make excuses, would you rather have that person leading your company? Would you rather have somebody managing your money that grew up in a colonia, that knew what it was to tighten their purse strings, that knew what it was to take what they had and to make something with it. Who would you rather have leading your organization and your system? And dare I say, an interesting concept would then be, when you're interviewing people, ask them a little bit about their childhood. You might hear them saying things that that's so Mexican. And so I'm going to leave you with this quote today. It's by Martin H. Fisher. He's a German physician. And he said this, All the greatest doctors receive their education 
on dirt floors, pavements, and living in poverty. Not on marble floors and not on foundations. Gracias. <laughs>